so hi. So uh, this is an experiment. Um, uh, I'm Avi. Uh, I thought it might be nice, since there's not a lot of conferences going on, to find uh, or experiment with some different ways of, of doing technical presentations. And, and what I was really looking for is something to replace the feel of a live audience. Um, and uh, and kind of make up a little bit for for the lack of that that direct connection and Q and A and so on that you get in a live venue, and so instead, what I thought I'd do is um, uh, record some talks, uh, record some people giving talks to me. So this is the first one, and um, Frank is going to talk about differential data flow. Uh, which is great because it's something that I uh, have always wanted to understand and not really understood. So Frank's going to walk through it and I'm going to ask him lots of annoying questions and uh, hopefully I will be a good proxy for everyone else as I do that. So yeah, I think I'll just hand things over to Frank and, and see how this goes. Oh, thanks, Avi. Yeah, definitely interrupt at any point. Um, the content is meant to be understood. So if something is you know, if I'm trying to like bludgeon you with something or, or just try to force <laughs> something through, just don't take it and, and ask some questions. Um, and that being said, oh, you can't do, sorry. Yeah. No, so that being said, um, it uh, there's going to be some stuff we're not going to cover from differential data flow here too. Uh, there's just a lot of, unfortunately, like a lot of stuff, but but this is meant to be like a, uh, an intro to it, like the key concepts, where, where the exciting moments are technically and what the, you know, the look and feel is meant to be. Um, but, but we'll, as, as we go along, I'll call out like why we're talking about each of these things. And hopefully there'll be some moments where if you've then realized this is not, not enough information for you, we can uh, work cool. through it. All right. So uh, because it's a talk, I, I put together a title slide. Uh, it feels a bit silly now, but the, the general gist of what we're going to be talking through uh, to warm, warm up viewers is the idea of uh, maintaining declarative queries, query, things like SQL queries or, or things like that, maybe data log if you like data log, um, queries over changing data, the so data that are not static, they're, they're continually evolving for whatever reason. And as Avi mentioned, uh, we're going to see an appearance, basically it's going to be about differential data flow, which is a framework that I've been working on for a while that is, is meant to tackle the problem of how do you describe computations uh, over data that change? How can you do that in a way that's pleasant and, and tries to do as much of the work as possible for you? Um, I'm, I'm Frank. I'm at Materialize at the moment. We'll, we'll say a bit about that at the end. Uh, this is you know, a tasty SQL wrapper around some of this core technology, but you can harass me either by email uh, here or on Twitter if, if you want to get a, a public uh, you know, opinion on something. All right. So um, right. here's uh, time. Uh, time. Time moves forward. So I'm just going like, to warm up. What are we even talking about? Like, why, what, What's the problem? And uh, time goes, let's, let's say here, left to right. And as time goes left to right, things happen, right? So maybe uh, someone tweets some things. Maybe in the course of tweeting things, people mention stuff uh, with hashtags. And sometimes uh, folks get mentioned, uh, individuals, uh, you know, with, with at references and Twitter. And this stuff is going on. This is, this is data. It's changing. Um, and people might have questions about it, queries that they want to express. So let's, let's take an example. We'll walk through something that gets progressively more complicated and, and intimidating. So someone might ask you to go and determine, well, what's, what's the most popular hashtag out there? Like, it's a topic that people are talking about, right? Um, and probably, I mean, many of the people uh, watching this probably have a sense for how they might go and do that, right? Whatever your favorite tool is, you could sort of pick that up and scan through a whole bunch of data and count up some things for each, for each hashtag and get out a number at the end, sort them, that sort of thing. Uh, let's make it a bit more complicated, though. Like, m imagine someone says, no, I, I actually want you to look at the pattern of tweets and look for uh, these sort of emergent communities where people talk to each other uh, and form these little components in the graph. Tell me, tell me the top hashtags for those, uh, for those communities. So not just, don't, don't tell me that you know, the most popular hashtag all across all of Twitter, that's, that's probably super boring. What's the interesting stuff that's going on within, within some communities? And this becomes a bit more complicated. There's actually like an algorithm now maybe involved. It's a little trickier to write in SQL. You could sort of write something maybe in data log or in a graph processing system. Um, but you start to have to stretch a little bit now to figure out how you, how you work with this. And if I had one more constraint now that I actually want this to be in near real time, 
So I, I want to see this information as soon as you can manage it because there's interesting stuff to do with it as soon as we learn about it. Right? If, if some people start talking about a cool topic and you want to get in there and either like help them out or, or like, you know, th throw some more information at them or, or surface that information to others. If this happens at the end of the day, it's not nearly as useful as sort of when it's, when it's going on. So these three constraints together are meant to be, well, ho hopefully, uh, we'll, we'll see what you think, but they're, they're meant to be, oh, that suddenly this is a lot harder than I expected. Uh, I'm not entirely sure what I'd do. But, and, and cer certainly that was sort of my reaction. I mean, my, you know, what is the most popular hashtag? Even in real time, you know, I can think about very easily writing probably just like a single node stream consumer that like keeps a, you know, whatever hash table, uh, some kind of like, you know, uh, I don't know, of the popular hashtags, right? Maybe of every hashtag it sees. Um, component of mention graph, I can certainly imagine doing something in some kind of like MapReduce like processing framework. Uh, but then getting that into real time, uh, suddenly it's like the tools I'm used to reaching for, like none of them are going to do that. Right? Yep. And to be totally clear, like this example didn't emerge as the most natural example of anything in particular. It's absolutely tuned to the sorts of problems we're going to attack. So it's, it's uh, uh, the tools that people are build, building up have almost certainly been targeted at um, more broadly useful use cases. So we're getting a bit specific here. Um, but uh, as, as we develop this up, hopefully one of the conclusions will be like, oh, I, I can start to see other things I could do with that that I wouldn't have even taken a swing at before. Yes, absolutely. Cool. All right. So um, let, me, let me sketch what we're going to talk about here. Uh, this is a moment where the text under it, I'll, I'll uh, see if I can wiggle this around. No, my cursor is gone. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> um, uh, a language and runtime for data that change is what's under there. And that's what we'll be talking about here. Uh, both, both a language. How do you talk about the sorts of things you want to uh, you want to ask about queries you want to do for your data, but also runtime and that we're going to try to build something that makes this easy for you, uh, not just walk away once we've gotten you to write it down. And the intended experience, right, is a few steps here. You write a query, and the goal is going to be to have you write a query as if you're running on static data. So, like, imagine the data don't change at all. You write a query without having to reason about things changing or interactions of, of, over time. Uh, so you write a query, and then having written your query, you just start changing the input data. Like you're allowed to do that. So you, the initial input data are initially empty, let's say, and so maybe your first step is, well, I should probably load in whatever's there right now. Uh, and that takes some time, uh, but eventually you're expected to see the, the output changes. So how does the uh, output change in response to your input changes? Uh, and you can then repeat the process. So you know, not drawn is from three back to two. You just, until you're comfortable, you can just keep changing the input a little bit and we'll hopefully efficiently be showing you changes to the outputs. So you add five more records in, we should show you uh, however many uh, output records change. And for sure, like the magic here happens, uh, the value, let's say, of, of the, the system happens between step two and three. So by getting you, the, business, the value proposition is that like by getting you to show up with step one, and write your query in a way that we understand. Uh, we're going to give you something back, which is cheaply, or you know, without causing you to write any code uh, or suffer any any headaches. We'll take care of correcting your computation from whatever inputs you used to have to uh, to the new changed output results on your changed inputs. And and I can't help. Uh, here, but to draw analogies to to reactive systems like spreadsheets, um, which which I've always thought of as as you know really one of the most successful systems for working with data in the small right, which have exactly this property that, that yeah. you set up your your computation and then you change the data and you get to very quickly see the output change um, or like observable HQ, um, which is, you know, a reactive notebook yep. and, and also is great for sort of small scale data. And, and I think, uh, you know, one of the dreams for me has always been to be able to apply those kinds of systems to the kind of large scale distributed data that, that I'm used to having to work in, in more of a batch regime, right? Yep. Um, so, so it's very, uh, um, yeah, yeah, seems very cool. Yep. Very exciting. No, it's absolutely, you're absolutely right. And like a lot of, there's a similar sort of, well, with spreadsheets, there's a similar sort of unglamorous goal here where like the goal isn't to introduce high concept tech that, that hurts your brain. The, the goal really is to try to, in step one, we're trying to reduce the complexity a lot. We're trying to make things easier and, and 
um, spreadsheets behind the scenes are a lot more complicated than you realize, right? They're not just, oh, yeah. I don't know, rerun everything. Um, similar sort of things going on here. Like try to have a natural experience that allows a lot of people to start using it, but then give them a whole bunch of cool functionality behind the scenes. Uh, I've got a few other things just to like call out that would be exciting to have here. So if, if we only needed to do one, two, and three, then uh, yeah, in principle, like maybe a spreadsheet um, is actually just, just satisfies that. But right. the actual additional adjectives that we're gonna try to throw in here, um, you know, we wanna make sure this is responsive uh, in the sense that if you have gigabytes of data and you change a few kilobytes of it, we don't wanna rescan everything. We don't need to be five minutes before you see the uh, updated answer. Uh, we'd like it to be somehow scalable. Like the, the goal here really is to tackle large volumes of data. Um, so we don't wanna design in scalability limits that, that mean that, well, it's only, only really handles like one thread's worth of something data. Um, and I put reliable on there too, though. This is mostly just gonna come up in that we very much, well, at least I very much want the sort of experience to have sort of clear semantics about what's going on. Like you wanna be able to trust what you see. Um, debugging this stuff is a, is a nightmare. Like if you try to debug reactive systems that don't have any particular properties, uh, you can never really tell like, oh, was, was my code wrong or was? So being able to rely on what you see and know, uh, ah, yes, this is a correct answer or didn't get an answer for some reason yet. At least I won't go and accidentally do something that, I, that I'll regret. And there's a and few more other dot, dot, dots so there, but. In, sorry, this is in contrast to maybe like an eventually consistent system where you're not sure, you know, at, at any given point, some number of the changes may or may not have been applied or to some kind of an, an approximate system where we're using sketches to, to estimate the values of computation, right? You want For example, to yeah, yeah. Act in an accurate system, right? So like a common example that, that people have nowadays are, are microservices all over the place where everyone has sort of a partial view of truth and they're all doing their best to try to try to keep current. But um, if something goes wrong, it can often, you have to untangle the entire system to figure out um, yeah. what's, what's transpired there. I, you know, 10 years ago, it was like distributed systems would do, would support callback soup stuff for you if you wanted, like you, you could send off a, a promise that would, uh, you know, eventually get fired and come back to you, but you don't really know whether you're waiting on it because it's your current still and nothing's changed or whether something's on its way. I don't know. It's all, uh, I don't, I don't want to say it's bad, but like it, it, it adds a new level of complexity for the person trying to understand what's going on. Yep. Um, so, uh, so with that in mind, actually, I guess we'll start with that, that last, uh, that last bit there, which is how should we describe uh, these changes to inputs and changes to outputs in a way that people, um, well, that are like crisp and clear, at least. So uh, changes uh, in consistency. Um, so the goal here is to try to, uh, for, before we start talking about languages and frameworks and stuff like that, what does it even mean to write down uh, changes to a collection in a way that is unambiguous, right? I, this is the goal here is to get people to describe their input changes and corresponding output changes in a way they can say, ah, that's exactly what that means. I'm, I'm comfortable seeing that. And I'll call out why this is important in, in just a moment, but, uh, but humor me for the moment. Um, so we're gonna, in all of differential data flow, think about uh, describing changes to collections as explicitly as possible. Uh, we're gonna use a, uh, a set of what we call updates, these triples. That set is gonna grow over time, but it's never gonna have things removed from it. It's not gonna have anything changed in it. Uh, we'll add stuff to it. Uh, but these triples each describe something that has changed in the collection at a particular time. Um, in particular, it's this triple of datum time diff, and it describes, just to sort of read it out here, what changed. Uh, the datum is, this is gonna be like a, maybe a row in your database or something like that. Or a record that, you know, some JSON that you've, uh, for some reason, you know, gotten and put into a collection and it might be experiencing a change. Uh, when did it change? This is the time. Uh, so almost all, basically all of differential data flows can be keyed off of some concept of time. This could be, this is logical time. It doesn't necessarily have strong meaning like connection to the real world. This could be a sequence number. If you're talking about databases and transactions, um, this could be real time if you're pulling data in, uh, if you're ingesting it off of some, some event bus or something like that but we're gonna have you explicitly stamp down the time into the change and say that this change happened at this time. 
And then finally, this diff is, uh, how did it change? And the simplest way to think of this is that this is a signed integer, like plus one means we added this datum to the collection, minus one means we removed this datum from the collection, or one copy of this datum from the collection. So what we're really saying is like, if you have, uh, if you have a collection at every moment in time, you can look moment by moment and say, how did it change? Like, did, maybe it didn't change at all, great. That, then we don't see anything with that, with that time. And if you look and say, well, there's three new records here and one record uh, is removed, that's four of these diffs that you write down with that, with that time. And I've got an example, but is that, is that uh, I, I'm, I'm, I can see your face there and it looks like you're, you're pondering. No, so, so, so this all makes sense. Um, the thing I'm pondering, if you go back a slide, I think there's something that, that I'm growing to suspect that you mean that I think uh, can be called out more explicitly here. Oh, good, I'm good. I'm gonna try to call it out more explicitly. Um, so when I first read this, I read this as you write a query, you change its inputs, and you see your output change. But that's not actually what you say, right? What you say here is you write a query, you change its input, and you see the output changes. You see the changes to the output, right? Um, and, mm. and, and so what I'm, what I'm uh, trying to understand at this point is, um, are you saying that this format for diffs is both the input and the output of your system? Does that make sense? That's absolutely true. Um, yeah, and, and you've managed to, uh, you managed to predict where we're going to go uh, with this. So this is this format for describing changes to collections is going to be universal within the context of differential data flow. It's both used for the inputs to computations, but also for the outputs to computations. And the time is going to be crucial. You're right that there's like a an unstated thing about uh, step three is actually more precise perhaps than it comes across, which is not only do you see changes in the output, you see the exact output changes that correspond to the exact input changes that you, you supplied. So it's going to have the exact same uh, representation. And in particular, it's going to have those times in it, too. So it's going to, if, if you say something changed at this exact nanosecond, we will produce output changes that describe things changing at that exact nanosecond. No, it won't actually happen at that nanosecond. But we will exactly correlate changes in the output with changes in the input. Right, because we're going to describe that the time then is the kind of time that we um, uh, are saying <laughs> that it changed rather than the time at which we computed the change. Yeah, yeah perhaps the presentation, uh, the time, time stuff is sort of unfortunately is baked in there for many years now. But if it were instead yeah. uh, a transaction number or something like that right. for, for a database, right. this is much more clear. This has nothing to do with, with the real world. Uh, or sorry, yeah. you know, the clocks or anything like that. And it makes a lot of sense to say that we're going to correlate uh, transaction IDs in the output with transaction IDs in the input. It makes a lot of sense about that. Absolutely. Yes. OK, cool. Um, but I'll, 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 I'll let you keep going. But oh, yes, perfect. That, yep. Uh, yeah. Cool. So it's just, this is fine. This saves some time in a future slide where we, we call this out exactly, and we can sort of cruise that a bit easier. I, I'm just going to throw up an example. So here's uh, yeah. an example, a little history of a bunch of events and like what they might mean semantically. So we have. Uh, four triples of key value relations. I, I imagine this is my my state or whatever. That initially, uh, at time 35, there's a new record that's introduced. The, there's a plus one. Nothing else happens at 35. So all that we really say is someone inserted a record there. At time 57, there's this this idiom of a subtraction and an increment at the exact same time, which you can think of as a modification. This is sort of how we would describe data was changed. Um, wasn't added or deleted, there's still some data that's in there that just happened to change from one value to, to another. Um, and then at time 73, there's a sort of freestanding event with a negative one, and that would just be a deletion. So if you might think of things as inserts, modifies, deletes, or something like that, um, you can naturally sort of translate in, these into these pluses and minuses. Uh, pluses and minuses have a few advantages, like they're, they're commutative, which is nice. You don't have to keep the order. Uh, uh, fixed if you want to um, you can sort of shake things around a little bit hand them off to other people to work on but but it, there's just basically two ways to write down the same sorts of information uh, so with that example uh, put up this is one of the points I think you're were, you're were getting at which is yes. the reason 
that we're doing things explicitly like this is not only so we can talk about your input collection, but we can think about your query uh, uh, as being between the input changes and some output changes and, and the system, or like what we're trying to build is the thing that automatically goes from an input history with a lot of changes to an out corresponding output history, as if we had reapplied your query at every moment in time. And so notionally, I, I have this kind of concrete input collection, um, but the output of my query is, is an output collection. And I'm also capturing the kind of changes over time to that output collection. Is, is that right? Yeah. So like if you think of, I mean, we can take some examples, but like if your query was take two relations and join them together and do a reduction or something like that, yeah. then potentially at every time in either of the inputs that something changes, if we were to reevaluate your query at that moment, the output might be a little different than what it was just a moment ago. And that would be a reason for us to need to write down a, a different a, a change in our, in our output yeah. collection there. So ideally, like the goal here is 100% that we are going to do this totally faithfully. Um, you, this will produce the same information as if you had all of your different input data collections and literally reran your query at every moment. It's just the input and output are compressed, and we're going to try to figure out, in some sense, how to compress the computation right. uh, inside. So compression okay. is, hmm. but, and the main thing that I wanted to call out here, actually, uh, well, there's a few things, but the main one that makes my life easy when we, we do this is that this makes the problem very much one of computation now instead of behavior, right? So we have an input, we need to produce an output, uh, and we know exactly I mean, if your query is deterministic and, and all these things, we know exactly what the output needs to be. We might have to do some work to compute it, but it's well-defined. And this is in contrast with some other systems. Like a good example maybe is a standard relational databases which have behavior. Like you might do a bunch of transactions and issue a query. There's no correct answer that's supposed to come out. There's some things they're not allowed to do, but they have some latitude. Uh, here we've changed the problem to be there's a correct answer. And that's going to make our lives a lot clearer. At least we're going to uh, have a lot more, you, we must do it this way structure, which is helpful. Yeah, it seems like there's an algebra here that, that sort of allows for, for a lot of testability for one thing, right? Which is to say that if I take my input collections, you know, run the query, apply the diff, run the query from the start, and then I diff those two output yep. results, Right, that should be the same as if I run the kind of diff computation on the diffs. Uh, yep. I don't know if that makes sense to yep. anyone. Yeah, no, absolutely. But, uh, this is this yeah. is how we do some of the testing for differential. Actually, is that we have some complicated algorithms like strongly connected components and breadth first search, and the test will actually go and form a se sequence of a thousand uh, different changes to the input graph, and it will compute both for every single thing a from scratch. Uh, you know, just rust code with no differential data flow. Yeah. Give me the answer, do the diff yeah. on the output, and confirm that that is exactly identical to what differential produces. Um, so you're absolutely right. It makes like testability, if that's not true, something is wrong. Uh, yeah. Sometimes it means yeah. something's wrong with the system, sometimes it means something's wrong with your expectations, but um, but it's, yeah, it's really nice to be able to rely on that, that, that if something's ever different sure. between those yeah. two. But I imagine that helps a lot with the with the reliability of the software in practice, right? Because yep. because you can you can reassure yourself that, that yep. it actually works. No, absolutely. Like debugging these things is uh, it's absolutely crucial to know when a thing has gone wrong and being able to bisect uh, where did we first see a mistake is crucial as opposed to just like flipping some coins and hoping that uh, uh, yep. we got it right. Okay. Cool. Cool. All right. So. Um, so the next step, I mean, a, a thing that, that we've observed is that the input and the output have the same, uh, the same structure, uh, which means that you could, in principle, compose these things. We're actually we're going to go in the opposite direction, which is to say that we're going to try to figure out how to uh, encourage people to take their queries, which are conceptually sort of monolithic big things, and uh, dissect them down into smaller and smaller components. So we might have your query break into two parts, where the first half produces some output collection or collections consumed by another part, we can dissect them a little bit more. Ideally, down to the point where what we have are operators rather than queries. And the goal here is to get you to, to get us to a world where we have these little atoms of computation that we understand, we the systems builders, uh, understand how to implement well. And you, the query writer, hopefully haven't lost too much by rewriting your query this way. And that's going to be something qualitative that we'll have to we'll have to figure out. But the hope is that we're going to retain several idioms that uh, 
the query writers from you know, databases or from sort of MapReduce big data style settings are still familiar with and hopefully still comfortable with. So I called out four of them here. There's, there's actually several on differential data flow, maybe like 10-ish or something like that. But there's some pretty natural ones like map and filter. Uh, map just transforms data as it, as it comes. Filter throws away data that don't match a predicate. These have, if you do the math out for these input diffs and output diffs, they have really natural implementations. You should just modify the, uh, the datum element according to the map function and the math just works out right. There's, you don't keep any state, you don't do anything like that. Right. Same with filter, you just you look at the record. If it passes the predicate, great, it's in your output. If it doesn't pass the predicate, you throw it away. You totally ignore the diff and the time components uh, for these operators. They're, they're wonderful. Um, there's some other operators. Uh, they're, they're a bit harder to implement, but, but the intended, uh, like the yeah. implementations are hopefully not, not what anyone's looking at. So we have like a, a binary join, for example, and binary join takes Two input collections that are both have a, have keys, so keys and values for each of them, and is meant to produce pairs in the output, uh, matching pairs like a key and a value one, value two, whose keys matched, um, like a relational equijoin uh, would. And um, that's the, the implementation is is indeed uh, non-trivial, but like the intent is that this is a very common idiom that people are familiar with if they're writing out queries. Oh, cool, I can just join these two things and let me say what has to be equal. Good. And uh, finally, in terms of like the sort of the common pool of things, there's a reduce operator, which takes in input collections that have key comma value structure and collects all the values with the same key and lets you run whatever logic you like on the values that, uh, uh, that got collected together. So if you want to implement like a top K or something like that reduces the sort of operator you would, you would use there. And, and this is very familiar to anyone who's worked with, um, you know, something like well, Hadoop MapReduce or, or Spark or, um, you know, a system I worked on, Scalding, that, that do indeed, you know, build up queries of, of exactly these kinds of operators, right? So, so certainly I'm, I'm very convinced that if you could, um, you know, implement uh, the, the diff algorithm for each of these operators that, that you would have something very expressive and powerful. Um, but, uh, but yes, I would not want to dive into trying to write oh, the no. diff or a join, right? Um, yep. Or for an arbitrary reduced function where, where the user provides uh, yep. the, the, the reduced function. Um, so, so yep. yeah. Well, fun anecdote. Uh, it turns out like distinct is the hardest operator to implement. Like it, it seems like it's, the join is actually fine. It turns out, like, I mean, it's work, but, but join has this nice bilinearity property, which means it's sort of like diffs on one side just need to get eventually hit into the accumulated state on the other side. It's sort of hard to screw it up. Um, distinct is, is actually really easy to screw up. Like of all the operators, that's the uh, that's the painful one. Distinct but. is sort of like reduce with a set union? It's sort of like reduce where you don't, I mean, in this case, it's like reduce where there aren't any aggregates, actually. Like if, if someone tells you right. the key right. and says like, only show me one of them. Don't ever show right. me two or three or anything like that. And uh, for technical reasons, it's, it, it hurts, yes. uh, but <laughs> cool. Um, there's one other operator that I will build up to. It's sort of this meta operator that allows you to write iterative computation, but we'll not start there because it's not actually a single data flow stage. Okay, cool. But, uh, but yeah, we, you know, we potentially get ourselves, we're trying to get ourselves into a world where we have uh, the, the user put together a, you know, I'm gonna think of it as a data flow, but we, we can think of it as, uh, as you like the sort of fluent programming style of, of maps and filters and joins and reduces that all get yep. either chained together or float around uh, as you like. And our goal now is to talk through how might we go and implement some of these operators. I'm gonna talk it through more with pictures than with, with code or, or any complicated details like that, just to get us to the point where we, we agree that like, okay, that, you know, that, that's possible. Like I can totally believe uh, how that would work. Again, some of them are really easy, but uh, it's the, the not easy ones that have some cool properties that, that make things interesting. All right, cool. So, we've got some pictures. Um, so we're gonna talk through, uh, like just, just first off, what's a, what's a natural incremental data flow operator? So where previously people have written out map, filter, join, whatever, I think of this as, as now sort of a pipeline of these diffs, right? So diffs are flowing into a map operator, then flow out of it and flow to the filter and then flow into some joins. And we're just gonna look at one of the operators here. Um, I don't know, reduce or something like that. I mean, make it complicated enough that you, you don't 
oversimplify unintentionally. So some diffs start to flow in. The diffs say things like, I'm a set of datum time diff uh, elements, and we need to produce some sort of output datum time uh, diff here. And uh, visually, actually, I'm going to show these coming in in batches that sort of correspond to time. So we think of the time here as being time zero, something like that. that that'll help. Uh, I've let it be whatever time we want. But uh, we're going to see sort of first bunch of changes, then, then some modifications, then some more modifications, and some more modifications. Yep. And for this, like, if we're just talking about the first collection, probably the diffs are plus ones. Great. We just apply the operator to the collected data, run with it, see what we get as output. Uh, mm -hmm. Just like you would with uh, with Spark or Hadoop or, or systems like that. Things start to get a bit more complicated, uh, not massively, but a little more complicated when someone then supplies some additional diffs. They come in, and we need to figure out what to do on uh, the output. And all that we really know is that there should be a relationship now between the accumulated input and the accumulated output, which we can sort of address with pictures if we want. We can take the accumulated input, apply the operator, subtract off whatever we put out in the past, and we get out the answer that we should we should ship. Uh, this is one of these nice moments where the pluses and minuses are really helpful because we can always do these additions and subtractions. Yeah. Uh, if we had some other framing for like updates versus deletions versus, I don't know, you'd have to be a lot more careful here trying to sort out what is the language of question marks that we can produce. But it's just pluses and minuses work out great for this uh, for this problem. And, and this, I guess, is that relationship that I was saying was made things testable, right? Which is that that you can perform the operation on x plus dx, and and then make sure that what you get is is that result minus the minus the original. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is a good point. So we're literally following. I mean, I'm just doing this with pictures at the moment. The code is different, of course, but like yeah. following the like, what are the ground rules? The ground rules are yeah. question mark needs to equal operator yeah. applied to x plus dx, and yeah. Indeed, that could totally be an implementation just for like uh, for checking our notes. It's like rerun the thing and make sure that it's that it works out. Um, we're gonna so, so in, the way that, in the way that people talk about like lawful like whatever monads or whatever like this is a law like all your operators have to follow this law yep. to be a valid yep. operator. Okay, uh, okay. I, that that sounds right. I have to be totally honest. My understanding of lawful monads is not, uh, but but <laughs> I, sounds good to me. Yep. But but it sounds like what people say. So yep. yeah yeah. Um, all right, so the build continues just a bit to show that we can uh, we can repeat this process. More changes come in. We got to produce some more outputs. And but again, we can just sort of draw these these little boundaries and say, well, it's just a bigger thing we need to apply the operator to, and a little bit more we need to subtract out. So the, the intent here is with the pictures at least is to convince uh, you, everyone watching, that um, this makes sense. Like you know, th there's there's crisp definition for what we need to do. Um, how we're going to do it is going to show up in just a moment, but at least we understand the, the task at hand. Yep. All right. Um, so this is just a sort of vanilla data flow. Uh, people have been doing this for a while. Uh, this is like at least 20 years old, almost certainly 40 years old. Um, you know, push some changes into an input, get some changes out the other, out the other end. Data flow has been around since since the 80s, uh, probably earlier. Um, so nothing, nothing new yet. Um, another thing that's not new, but is still pretty cool, is using the same techniques for iterative data flow. So if you uh, think of this operator, which has changes coming in, changes going out, and you wire its output back to its input through maybe some other computation, um, this is, uh, is now a process that's going to run for a little while. Uh, it, it's similar, if, if you're familiar with this, to uh, semi-naive bottom-up data log evaluation. This is, uh, data log is this declarative language for like producing facts and stuff like that. And one of the execution strategies is Give me some rules for producing new facts. Great, I'll produce as many new facts as I can. And I'll feed them back into my fact-producing rules, and I'll repeat for as long right. as I'm generating new facts. Yeah. Um, yeah. And similarly, this like for, for any computation you like, actually, any that you can rig up uh, in this framework, you can set up this nice cyclic data flow, which will keep pushing changes around until they stop circulating. Uh, and maybe that never happens. That'd be bad. Um, but if this reaches a, a fixed point, if it stops changing for any reason, how that manifests is that we just stop getting diffs. And the system quiesces, and uh, we're really happy. So if we were going to do something like connected component computation, that's commonly done with an iterative algorithm on right. data that are uh, relationships in the graph. And it looks like a bunch of joining and then, and then reducing until things stop changing. 
So you could use the same some some relationships that you know, and then you infer other relationships from them, and then from those relationships you can infer yep. yet more yep. relationships, and you end up with the transposure over these things. Yeah. For example, yep, yep. Um, so I, I mentioned this now because this is this is sort of the exciting moment of departure from the previous twenty to forty years uh, of work, where differential data yep. flow takes a hard right turn. Um, so. Both of these things are cool, the, both the incremental data flow stuff that we saw before and the iterative data flow. The problem is that uh, they both co-opt the notion of time. Right? They both say, ooh, I want to be in charge of first, second, third, fourth, you know, at, at infinitum. Um, yeah. And the computation is not correct anymore. Like if, if we do that transitive closure thing where, where we start pushing along the graph information like uh, Frank can reach Bob, Bob can reach Alice, et cetera, et cetera. And then someone just throws in the deletion of an edge, for example. They say, oh, this edge isn't there anymore. We can't just keep propagating stuff. I mean, we, we could. We wouldn't have the right answer, though. Uh, so things go wrong if you try to let both iteration and exogenous changes to your data drive the changes. So differential data flow, like the main thing that it does that's fundamentally different is to come up with a way to deal with this, basically, to let you do incremental updates to iterative computation. And the gist here is, um, let's imagine that this this is an iterative computation. So we went and we so, propagated so, some. So actually, oh, let me let me let me pause you there, right? So you yeah, said sure. the main new thing is that it lets you do incremental updates to iterative computations, right? So if we were doing incremental updates to, you know, a straightforward non-iterative query, then you're saying that that kind of the older data flow stuff would still have been able to handle that, okay, right? It doesn't have those cycles, and so so it can still kind of do it. Yeah, so I want to, it's a good, a good distinction here. So I think like the main point is that for, I have an academic background and anytime anyone asks me like, did, did you invent a thing? There's a very clear answer, which is like, for some of these, absolutely not, right? Like this is, yeah. this was yeah. known um, out there. There might not have been good, good technology to use. Uh, like if, if you wanted to do this um, today, actually, there aren't a lot of great options. Uh, differential data flow happens to be one of the nicer things to use, even if you just want to do streaming joins and reduces. Um, right. So that's that's my impression, right, is that that as a practical technological matter, right, even if I want us to do it without iteration, that actually, you know, differential data flow would be a really attractive framework to do it in, right? Yeah. Um, but, but from an academic point of view, the kind of novelty yeah. is it in the, the addition of being able to do yeah. this for, for iterative things, like, yeah. like traversing a graph. So for example, like, Apache Flink has been around uh, for you know, five or six years already now and has been doing similar, similar sorts of stuff. Um, uh, sorry, not iteration, uh, streaming acyclic data flow graphs. Yeah. And, and they would be rightly furious if uh, you know, I had announced that this is the first time anyone's been able to do that. And sorry, they basically, I, I you said was doing that? Oh, Apache uh, Flink. Um, Flink, so, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Um, and, and other folks, I mean, different, they're different. You know, Storm is something that, that has done streaming for a little bit. And if you layer some more frameworks on top of that, it looks a bit sure. more like SQL uh, maintaining the stuff. There's some things I like about differential data flow, but uh, at this point, it's more opinions. Um, but the iteration thing is definitely not an opinion thing. This is this right. is something that, right. that uh, other systems are going to struggle with. Cool. Okay. All right. So um, so so we're imagining this this picture in front of us as describing iterative computation. Um, like we, we've done the very first round, for, for the first round of input data, someone gave us a big graph that had some people and we wanted to figure out who's connected to whom. And we circulated information for a little while and eventually it died down. And now someone came along and said, I'd like to maybe remove uh, 100 edges. I don't know. Maybe add some edges too, but, but I want to do a fundamental change that is going to be more complicated than just continuing to run the process uh, on the modified data. We know that we can't just slap it at the end of these uh, dot, dot, dots because, well, we have no reason to believe that'll be correct. Um, what we can do is some other slightly different surgery where we just uh, visually offset it in a different direction. So, uh, I mean, it feels like it's cheating a little bit to say like, oh, we just visually offset it. But, but in fact, this is, this is what we're actually gonna do. Um, so we have a, a different change to X that's uh, for a different reason, essentially. Like this, this is a change to the first round of input data that happened, not because of iteration, but because of uh, some external change. And as long as we can annotate that correctly, like as long as we're clear uh, in ourselves about why a thing changed, it doesn't have to be a problem. Like we can do the same thing 
uh, on our output side too. We can say, well, here's a, an output change. Now bear in mind that it's not an output change at the end of the dot dot dots. It's an output change to that first uh, thing for a different reason. And we do the same math here. Like we can still figure out, oh, well, x plus dx, y, you know, some subtraction, all that stuff. And to avoid making this too abstract, like the story here is that we can totally use timestamps that are not integers. Um, you know, everything that we've, it, it's quite possible that everyone listening along has been like, oh, timestamps, cool, you mean integers. Or date time or something, I don't know what. But there's no particular reason that we need to do that. And differential data flows observation, I guess, or like the, the work that it goes through is to say, well, pairs of integers are fine too. Uh, like all of the math works out with, with pairs of integers as well. And pairs of integers, and, and more interesting, complicated things beyond, but pairs of integers give us a second degree of freedom to describe two different ways in which a thing might change. One coordinate is iteration counter and one coordinate is a uh, round of external change. Okay. And this process can now compete, uh, com uh, continue, sorry. Um, the dy can sort of flow around and come back as another dx. And the really, the exciting, like if there's one build in this whole thing that's, that's relevant, it's this particular picture here, which is that what differential data flow does that's relatively good or new or whatever, is it allows you to take subsets of your input changes that uh, aren't forced to include all of any particular dimension. So here we're grabbing two diffs in one direction, two diffs in another direction. And relating that to the output, where we accumulate two diffs in one direction, two diffs in another direction. Um, and this is uh, a bit weird. I mean, like figuring out what's going on here is, is a bit. Um, uh, well, I don't know. I've, I've had a while to chew on it myself, and I'm totally comfortable with it now. Like, I think this makes lots of sense. But in a sense, what we're doing is, is trying to figure out a way with these two dimensional timestamps to tell the operator you only need to do certain amounts of diffing. That, that third dx over there on the, on the line, it's not relevant yet. Don't worry about, like, we're not gonna include it in the input yet. Don't worry about subtracting it from the output either. That's just gonna be a bunch of noise. No one needs to hear about that. Um, so we're gonna focus for the moment just on fixing up, up through the second iteration. And that's only gonna be these four boxes on both the left and the right hand side. Yeah, so 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 let me let me make sure this is actually something that that you you um, that I didn't completely grok about the orange boxes, right? Um, before, uh, so let me just make absolutely sure that I've got it now. Everything in the orange box um, is either an input to the operator, or I guess in the case of the like bottom right dy is the output from the operator for this one like computation it's doing, is that right? Yeah, so the visual idiom with the boxes is meant to be that whenever boxes get drawn, we're trying to describe a, an equivalent, a, a relationship that has, so I don't call it an equivalent, but um, right. the output box needs to equal the operator applied to the input box, whatever that, whatever that happens to be. So whenever there are two boxes, so that's, that's what they're saying, is that these two need to correspond. Um, and in most cases, they need to correspond by adding one more little purple box in that we yeah. can solve for by doing a lot of subtraction. But but is it the case that the operator to, to find that last purple box, right, is going to take all of the other kind of knowns as input, right? The implementation of the operator. Kind of. So, so, so we'll I talk guess a, what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. We'll talk a bit about the implementation again with some pictures in okay. just a moment. And it can be a little simpler than that. Um, like we can accumulate up some state and stuff like that. We can make it not, uh, you don't have to rescan all sorts of stuff. But for sure, like the trade-off here is that um, by having a slightly more complicated, well, maybe substantially more complicated operator implementation for any one moment in time, yeah. we can do orders of magnitude fewer, uh, like we produce substantially fewer diffs in our output. So by doing more tasteful and selective diffing of our uh, inputs and outputs, the diffs themselves shrink by orders of magnitude as if, you know, compared to restarting the computation or something like this. Right. Um, right. Yeah, the, the prior state-of-the-art tech and things like, well, state-of-the-art is rough, but for a lot of the data log sorts of algorithms, they'd look and they say, oh, geez, I'll, I'll first figure out how much I have to blow away out of my input when I want to move on to the next round. And potentially it's a lot. And they redo a lot of, a lot of work because the diffing isn't super sophisticated. And not that this is super sophisticated diffing, but by being a bit more selective about what we actually try to get to line up, 
we can produce much smaller diffs in the output, and that uh, saves us a lot when it comes to, uh, you know, if that's 100x reduction in diffs, well, if the operator is three or four times more expensive, that's, maybe that's fine. The, the thing in this slide that I'm, that is not quite clicking for me yet, and feel free to just tell me sure. that, like, you know, either it gets explained later or that I don't need to understand it or that it's, uh, you know, that I'm interpreting it over literally. But uh, it's not totally obvious to me why um, we would, so if we have a diff to the initial state, right, that, that first kind of DX coming in on the second row there, uh, and then, yes, obviously, we're going to produce a DY that only applies to, to, to the initial Y output. Um, but if we're then feeding back in as part of some iterative process, some, some second DX on that second row, it's not yet obvious to me that that would only have implications on the like second DY in the top mm. row. Right, like, like it, it feels to me like at that point, like, and, and maybe I've just kind of like shut down and I'm not thinking about it anymore, but like at that point, like, who knows, right? Like anything yeah. could have changed, you know, this could have implications, you know, with a huge blast radius. And so it's really interesting to me that, that you're able to say, no, actually, we like we scope this down to this equivalence and, and we really can ignore everything out of the orange boxes because that's not obvious at all. So, so let me, let me I mean, you, you're onto something actually, and I've glossed over a little bit of stuff here, but I think there is still a true thing to recover from the picture. Um, you're absolutely right that the, um, uh, so changes at times uh, can result in output diffs at other times that are beyond them, which is a slightly weird thing that we're not used to. Uh, so it's possible that the box on the left-hand side, two by two box, needs to produce diffs outside of the orange box. Uh, that's absolutely possible. Um, let's not talk about exactly why it happens because it, this is part of the brain hurdy stuff. Um, yep. What is true though is that if we need to solve for what's in the right-hand box, that only relies on information in the left-hand box. Right. So because things can't influence things backwards in time, uh, essentially. Uh, so our goal in writing this operator is not exactly to take each input diff and produce all possible all of the output diffs, but rather uh, one by one to produce the appropriate output diffs by looking at what input diffs we've received up to this point. Got it. So the claim is to be able to produce the the d the kind of bottom right dy there, we only need to know the stuff in the orange boxes. Yep. Yep. Um, we don't need to know anything else. And yes, that is more uh, intuitive. Yep, or, good. Or, okay. In early cool. days implementations what of this, we- wise, like that's, that's for later and we'll figure that out later with more input. Yeah, yeah there's a lot of math to do with this. So in early days, on the, we used to try to take everything on the left-hand side and resolve it fully. And you can do that too, it's a different implementation. Um, right. it, has, it has the defect, which is uh, too bad, that it does some speculative computation. Basically, like so, when we produce a, a diff at time five, like you know, a second level time five, we might be producing a diff that eventually gets retracted uh, yeah. once three, four, and five show up on the left hand side. Yeah. And this is fine, but like unfortunately, people write code uh, like UDFs and stuff like that that might panic or something. You know, do a division by zero. That right. our math would say, oh, it's fine. It gets retracted later on. Yeah. But, right, right. But actually, your computer has crashed and um, it's too late. Yeah. Um, okay. So we, we, we're fairly conservative about how we execute these things. We just make sure to unravel time by time when we know that we're going to um, going to need it. Yeah. Interesting. Thank you. That was very helpful. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. No, I'm glad. Um, visually, this just continues a little bit to point out that like this can continue indefinitely. We can sort of fully repair an iterative computation uh, out until that converges as well. And sort of maybe have to trust me that it sort of acquiesces at the same time. Um, there's some theorems that you can prove that we don't ever end up doing any more work than there are actual diffs that happen. Right. And basically indefinitely down, down the screen, we can do arbitrary changes to uh, iterative computations uh, this way. And not shown because we don't have this, the screen spaces. You can totally nest these iterations if you want. You can have three-dimensional timestamps. We have iterations within iterations. And 
Um, yeah. At some point, this is just being obnoxious, but like, sometimes it's helpful. <laughs> so uh, just going to call out a little bit about like some implementation details by picture, just to show off why maybe it's not nearly as terrible as take the whole input pile and reevaluate everything. Uh, so a lot of our, our operators are, are data parallel, meaning um, you can take the input collections and partition them up and have independent instances of these operators uh, run correctly and just sort of merge all of the results together. So for example, a map operator, you can just you know, slice up the data however you like, have the map operator run independently on all the records. If you want to do a join or reduce, you might need to shuffle the data by key. So you can sort of slice up the data. And as long as you send the appropriate subsets of the data to appropriate uh, same operators, uh, this is all good too. All right, so in some sense, if you're updating the counts associated with, with hashtags, and someone gives you a new hashtag, you know, hashtag uh, gradient com, we don't need to reevaluate, obviously, don't need to reevaluate all of the counts for all the other hashtags. That's, sure. that's yeah. a disaster, don't do that. Uh, but, but this is you know, increasingly important in, in these diffing setups where uh, we have relatively more expensive operators now that do more complicated work, and we need to be pretty careful to make sure we don't do work when there is nothing to do. And just the visual version of that is like, yeah, as changes come, people can independently produce these diffs. And in magical moments, uh, some operators won't get any changes. Great, they don't do any work. Um, and this, you know, as long as it shuffles around and balances pretty well, the, the throughput of the system, we can sort of crank through a whole bunch of these times uh, at the same time, essentially, because uh, the operators only needed to do work for their actual changes. The throughput of the system, essentially, goes up, um, essentially we look at like how dense are the updates, you know, how many workers can handle, or operators can handle a certain number of updates per second, as opposed to timestamps per second, because they're really only doing work when they're updates, uh, as opposed to the distinct moments of time that pass. Yeah. All right, so what, is, what does one of these look like? Um, there's some state associated with the operator, so let's imagine we're doing distinct or something like that. Um, again, map and filter are pretty simple, don't have, don't have a lot of state, but distinct is uh, uh, an operator that carries some state with it. Um, we're going to naively just sort of write down for each of these operators, and we've sharded these potentially really aggressively, so maybe there's one operator per key, something like that. Um, you know, not actually a thread or something like that for each key, but uh, the state gets sliced as thinly as the data parallel uh, structure allows, so if it's, you know, for each hashtag, we might have some counts or something like that. And as a, as a change flows in, uh, we're just going to implement sort of the logic that we, we talked about in pictures, which is to compare this time D that we've gotten to each of the existing times, A, B, C. And for each, uh, for each time that checks out, we are going to fold both the input and the output into the sum that we're, we're trying to track and do the appropriate differencing from the operator applied to the input. Let's us figure out what the diff is in the output. and then we stash the input and the output uh, in, our, in our state here and, and continue along. Uh, there's a little bit of magic that I'm not going to talk about. Uh, it's, it's cool, but it's, it's math and some theorems, and it's, it's more symbols than it is anything else that allow us to compact up the state. So in traditional uh, incremental data flow stuff, you'd say, oh, I should only ever have the most current uh, view of time. Like if, if you've folded in some data, make it as current as possible. I'm always going to be reacting to the most recent time anyhow. Yep. And that's not true here anymore with these two dimensions. Uh, yes. So we need a different bit of math to help us figure out how do we keep a minimally compact footprint. And it has a nice property that it devolves to, like in the one dimensional case, it's exactly you know, keep the current data for me. But in the multi-dimensional case, we are able to sort out which dimensions don't matter anymore. And we can compact things down to, which turns out to actually be a provably minimal uh, footprint. If you had compacted it any further, uh, you wouldn't be able to produce correct answers anymore. That's that's. There's a theorem. It's cool. I, I don't know. We're not and, gonna. That's all I'm gonna say. No. You don't get runaway growth, right? Because I look at this and and I think, okay. I mean, this feels like I'm gonna, you know, now run this system for a long time, and I'm gonna have this problem where where my my state just like grows in unbounded ways, and eventually my node falls over. So what will happen, um, the easiest way to think about it is if you, have, if you have one dimension that's sort of continually advancing, and often we do, often this is time or something like that, that it's, it just continues to move forward. 
then the, what the system can realize based on how you interact with it is, um, oh, great, after your input has moved past time t, you no longer care about the distinctions between t minus one and t minus two, or t minus three and t minus four, any of these things. So I could just treat all of those times uh, along that dimension as equivalent and just fold all of them up together. Yep. That doesn't integrate out everything, so we don't get a zero dimensional point at the end of that, which is what a lot of people's intuitions would be for you know, keep the current value. We might get a one dimensional thing, which still keeps track of each of the diffs at each of various iterations in an iterative computation. Right. But we keep the current history along that iteration, along that dimension. Um, right. And it's, you know, it works out. Like it's definitely, um, none of this, is, this isn't for free or anything, right? Like, so your memory footprint will almost certainly go up if you are using iterative computation, for example, because we're gonna keep a trace there. It's not nearly as lean as you just wanted the counts. Right. Um, but it's better than keep a copy of the data at every iteration. And, and, uh, or you, if, if your choice is put together some existing, I don't wanna call people up, but like an existing data flow system and build a 100 stage pipeline for each round of iteration, all yes. of that collected state is gonna be massive and you'll be much happier having done the diffing. Yeah. 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 So I've drawn the state this way, it's just a few more points to make. Um, uh, drawn the state this way with the input and output separated apart to try to make a, a pretty cool point that, uh, that I like and we scribbled up in a paper recently, uh, which is that uh, some operators are like reduce, for example, is absolutely going to need both its input and its output arranged uh, in the following ways. But there's some operators that turns out only need their their input uh, arranged for them. And uh, this is the join operator. It turns out it's going to need it has two inputs and it's going to need both of them maintained. But it doesn't actually maintain its output. Uh, it turns out that it can avoid doing that because to you know, correctly update itself when it gets a change on one of its inputs. It just needs to look at its other input and, and check that out. And uh, this is pretty cool for the reason that uh, the state that we're writing down here is this, uh, if you're coming from database lens, this uh, multi-versioned uh, uh, store. Essentially, we're, keep, we're explicitly writing down diffs at various times. We're not mutating the internal state. Uh, we're, just, we're keeping around uh, all of our history here, which is going to allow us to uh, interestingly, to share some state between uh, different yeah. data flow operators that might use the same data, right? So I guess the example here is maybe you're joining a collection of customer data with, with something else. And the customers are all indexed by customer ID. It's the primary key. And if the join that you're doing says, get me customers by their customer ID, um, in, in two cases, they can literally use the exact same in-memory data asset, which tends to be uh, pretty common in a lot of these relational settings, right? So when, when analysts sit down and say, I've, I've got 20 relations in front of me, someone spent some time on a schema, so I know what the primary keys are for them. Um, you know, I have some nice star snowflake schema. So often when I go and I hit these relations, I'm actually going to be joining them with their primary key to, you know, take a, a, a fact table, for example, I'm gonna join it with a bunch of dimension data on its primary keys. Uh, we see that, you know, all of those uses of those those sort of dimension data with their uh, primary keys are repeated between between all these queries, and it's a real a real pity if you'd had to spin up uh, for each new query that comes along a new copy of all of that data indexed and maintained. Uh, given that you know there may be twenty copies of it already live in your system, and uh, one of the neat things that differential data flow can do is share the state between its operators when when appropriate, right? when they're actually looking at the same data. Uh, with the same keys. Um, and the, the other thing that's really valuable about the join operator not needing to maintain its output state is that the, not always, but often the outputs of a join are much larger than yeah. its input. Mm -hmm. yeah. the effect. Um, and so, so, you know, letting that just kind of sit on the downstream and, and not have to be stashed at the node feels, yep. uh, feels it's absolutely correct. So, like one of the one of the engineering pain points, at least with um, that differential sort of rode through and had to, had to deal with, it was um, people are going to put data into joins. It's going to, especially with with graphs and stuff like that, an initial amount of of state at nodes is going to expand out massively. And almost always, the plan is, oh, don't worry, I'm going to reduce it in just a moment. Um, yeah. But it's it's not acceptable to like to sit on that intermediate data, right? Like it's 
that data will exist in, in something like like Spark, Hadoop, or whatnot. You'll write it down somewhere. Like it'll go across a data exchange. That that's fine. It's it's not meant to live forever. But a stream processing system needs to figure out what to do with that data. Like you, you can't just spike up your memory use to a terabyte, saying like, oh, don't worry, I'll I'll, I'll aggregate it down to ten gigabytes in just a moment. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's important in this case that the join operator carefully like only emits a few million records and then yields control and lets the reduce operator run for a little bit. Then the join operator runs, does a little bit more. Uh, the system underneath the covers handles all this stuff for you. But you know, in, in early days when we didn't handle that stuff, it's like, ah, <laughs> you know, something just happened and the system fell over. Why? But, but sorry. Yeah. Okay. So the, the, the gist here was, uh, hooray. There's some cool relational idioms that, that we can accommodate at surprisingly low memory footprint. Um, yep. We'll see, we'll see how far that goes, but that seems to be pretty useful. Uh, there's a citation I'll throw up in just a bit for that uh, to a VLDB paper. Uh, but yeah, uh, this is so basically like winding down now. Um, a thing we didn't really talk about is like code-wise, how is this actually implemented? Like what, what, what's this? It's written in Rust, okay, that's, that's a thing, but like uh, if you're not moving pictures around, what, um, what other parts are involved? I'm just gonna call these out and sort of give some forward references to where people can learn about them. So differential data flow is built on top of timely data flow, which is sort of like the operating system underneath all this stuff. Like it is fairly unopinionated about about uh, what operators should do or what data means. It's more about turning on and scheduling fibers and setting up communication channels and stuff like that. Uh, I think that's really cool, uh, really cool stuff. Um, there's a repo, uh, you can go and check that out. On top of differential, like maybe you don't like writing Rust. Uh, a lot of people, turns out, don't like writing Rust. Um, or they don't like waiting for Rust to compile, for example. So differential programs, you know, the, it's a thing. Like it, they go fast once they're compiled. But if you want to write a new differential program for each analysis, it's going to, there's going to be a few minutes between um, running it a second time. So uh, what we're doing at Materialize actually is like trying to extract a bunch of common idioms and provide an interactive experience using something that looks like SQL 92. So you lose some of the expressive power of differential data flow. But in some ways, that's a good thing. Like there are a lot of people who uh, are comfortable with a different, different framework, SQL, uh, of, of different flavors. Um, and by wrapping that up and sort of pre-chewing a lot of the parts, uh, you, you actually get you know, sub-second interactive queries against live data joins and reduces and stuff like that. And there's just some pictures for this. Sorry, you're about to, you're about to ask a thing. I'll, I'll throw these up and we can chat. Yeah, no, I, it's actually probably yeah better for me to ask the question here. Um, so, so having the SQL interface seems fantastic, and I mean I, I've certainly seen in in lots of places that SQL becomes much 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 more accessible to people who are you know non programmers or even even programmers often um, than uh, than having a, a the kind of fluent data flow API that that you show at the differential level. Um, are you exposing anything iterative in the SQL? Because of course, you spend a lot of time talking about how much of the yeah. technology is directed towards allowing the incremental iterative processing. Yep. And then it, it feels to me naively like SQL then just like goes back to like the old style data flow. Yep. Right? So there's two things here. Um, SQL definitely has, so SQL 99 has uh, with recursive, which allows you to build recursive queries that essentially okay. like the iterate operators, they have some constraints on them, but Weirdly, like we don't need to. The constraints are like you can't issue queries that don't have certain structures, and we can just remove those requirements. Like differential is capable of executing uh, right. a, a broader class of things than SQL specs out. Um, the main trick at the moment, so to be totally clear, like materialize is not the, the goal. There is not to surface as much of differential as possible. It's mm -hmm. to sort of figure out what people actually want out of differential, and by and large it's not yet people who really want recursive queries. Uh, I, right. We'd love to find those people because if we find those people, <laughs> this is the only thing that they can use. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. But I think a lot of people are still getting their heads around. Um, I think there's a gap between when people come and use SQL and, and try to write queries, they're describing information need more than they are uh, describing computation they want to have happen. And a lot of iteration uh, ends up in some part at least about driving computation like with iterative computation you get more efficient versions of things um, for sure sometimes it's even mandatory but one of the things i've seen a lot with differential is that you can just write in a more efficient algorithm where people would have otherwise written a very expensive query um, 
So for the moment, we're not doing with recursive, uh, though it's it's on the roadmap. Uh, but it's one of these things that this would absolutely move the instant a, a person says this is crucial to me, and, and here's how you know we can both succeed if you do it. Um, you know we know how to do it. Uh, another thing though that, that is actually I think is really cool and might be more relevant is the two-dimensional notions of timestamps, for example, show up in a lot of uh, a lot of applications out there uh, as bitemporal or multi-temporal data analysis. So in finance, for example, you have often two dimensions of time, sort of what you knew and, and when you knew it are both important concepts there. Yeah. And there are a lot of uh, tools that basically require bitemporal uh, capabilities to be able to not only say what is the current state of the database, what is the history of the database, but also when did that history change and when were things known to be at a certain time. Um, and you can sort of see this in other cases, like if, you, if you're doing a, a booking system or something like that, you want to say how many hotel rooms, as, as of right now, how many hotel rooms will I have open three weeks from now? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's two different notions of time that you can write the query, like you can try to bake this into SQL, um, put a bunch of extra columns about times and stuff, but now you're writing the view maintenance yourself and, and it's all a bit uh, a bit grotty. So that's a, that's a different angle that differential might make. Um, when we think about like what are the sort of quantum leaps up in terms of text slash complexity, giving access to these multidimensional times is another one that, um, um, yeah, actually, I mean, uh, sorry, another thing that people, viewers might be familiar with is that streaming systems have traditionally had this big problem with the fact that there's event time and system time. Like an event shows up and says, I happened at time T. And the system says, that's wonderful, but T was five minutes ago. What am I supposed to do with you? And there are these two notions of time that w when an event was produced and when it was received, that if they fall out of sync, a lot of stream processors get really stressed out because they have one integer that they get to use for time. And either they hold up the show waiting for everyone to show up on time, including you know, the person who powered off their device and is only going to upload their data next time they get a, a full charge, um, or they, they clock things based on when was the data received, and now you start losing some of the uh, transactional properties. Like if, if we're trying to get a consistent view of the past at, at some moment in time, it, we lose that and it's now just what does the system see? So using those two time dimensions actually for event time and for system time gives a, a data processor, a nice incremental data processor that a person can look at and say, hey, I've got a question relative to system time or I've got a question relative to event time. I don't have right. to decide when I turn on the system, which one is it going to be? Um, so that's also, Another, um, you know, we'll see what people push back on the most, but if, if people really need out of order data processing with unbounded windows, uh, something that differentially can sort of flip the switch and, and make happen. Yeah, interesting, interesting. I, I, can, I can feel a lot of possibilities there sort of at the edges of my ability to articulate them. Yeah, but... to be fair, like I'm, I'm, I might sound like a bit flip and casual with these things. They're definitely not trivial. Like the main reason we haven't done most of them is that communicating them to people is hard. Like we know the system can do it, but yep. trying to find the right idiom for like, how, how do we give this to a person to use without having them basically just pick up the phone and call us back and say, what the hell is going on here? I don't understand. Right. So we're sort of blocked on that as well. Yeah. Yeah. The other much more out there thing that, that this makes me, think about, um, you know, the way you describe kind of the, the differential operators here uh, is, is similar to the like auto diff, auto grad systems that people use in machine learning, right? And uh, I kind of wonder what would happen if you combine the two so that you, you could have a function that was a computation on data and did a lot of this data flow join and filter and so on um but that ended up producing the the derivative with respect to some of its inputs such that you could then optimize based on that gradient right um yep. and uh usually the the structure of the data or the cardinality of the data in these these auto diff systems is is taken to be either constant or kind of very limited in how you're able to to, to change it in terms of change your inputs right and and so um you know this might might make for a much more flexible sort of optimization or sampling system of course i have no idea what that would actually end up looking like but but it does seem like an interesting thing to research I think it's an open question, yeah. I mean, for sure, so just to, to add some flavor here, the win with differential data flow 
is for sure uh, very much it's acting on discrete data, and we're looking for discrete changes. So yeah, plus minus ones with a whole bunch of zeros is our fantasy world. And some of the more continuous machine learning stuff doesn't it is instead interested in slightly more continuous functions. It doesn't matter the data don't have to be sparse or anything like that. But the functions are understood to be a bit more. You know, you're passing it through a logistic function or something like a logistic sigmoid. That's we, that's just analytically tractable. We'll figure out what the right answer is. If you use differential for that, of course, like it'd just repeatedly be reinvoking the same functions. On the flip side, if you took the auto differentiation stuff um, and tried to you know run iterative computations with UDFs, um, I don't know. I think it's in, in part open. I don't want to make limiting statements about about that work. It might all be solved. Um, but it, it does feel like uh, if you come up with a natural interface, uh, picking the implementation for how to do the incremental computation based okay. on the qualitative characteristics of the bit of, of code. Like if you believe this is a smooth function, but not necessarily one with sparse uh, support, maybe you pick something from the right. uh, auto differentiation side of things. And if you think it's much more of a combinatoric sort of problem with discrete uh, inputs, maybe this other uh, strategy is more appropriate. Yeah, I, I I certainly don't you know uh, don't have even the, even a sketch in my head of of what marrying those two systems would act actually look like in practice, but it, but it does seem like like there's something yeah. handling there, maybe. No, they're definitely they're both they're they're sanely related, and uh, as far as I'm aware, no one's actually stuck them together yet. Uh, probably because it's harder than than it seems. <laughs> yeah. So, cool. so there's one last slide, and it's just sort of throwing up some references. Um, uh, for people who are interested in following up on more stuff, uh, I'm sure we can get these links in like a non non video form too. But there's a paper. It's actually it's about to be presented in uh, uh, just a few weeks. Actually at VLDB, uh, hopefully Andrea Latuada, one of the co-authors, will be presenting it. Um, uh, they have you know it's a, a video that's going to be recorded and played across the world, so it should be accessible to people. There's some repos up there like if you want to check out the. Um, the timely data flow, differential data flow stuff. It's all open source. You can go there and, and grab it. There's a lot, a lot of docs, a lot of examples, stuff like that. And then materialize, if you're interested, uh, is out there. You can go and grab that and use it. Uh, it's much more of a like a product in some sense. Like you, you use it and it has an expected way that you're going to use it as opposed to the others, which are libraries that you're meant to screw around yeah. with. Um, but at the same time, that makes it a lot easier. Materialize a lot easier to get into and just start start playing with.